Good morning, this is Kurt Agley with the PPI Group. I'm a Senior application Specialist here at the PPI Group and I'm going to be doing a two-part webcast. This is part one of extending BIM to the whole project team. We'll be doing the second one just a week from now and I would invite you to join that as well. We're going to pick up where we left off but continue on. A little bit more of a construction emphasis will be in this one as well. The people that have uh, tuned in um, to the webcast, um, I recognize a lot of you and I, I know that you're all at different stages in your BIM adoption and using it in production and in construction. Um, so um, what I'm trying to do with the agenda is see whether or not I can make this valuable to everybody. I'll probably start just kind of briefly with um, focusing on the ones that are at the early stages, so um, uh, moving from 2D CAD. And uh, then we'll go from there um, fairly quickly into drilling down into individual applications that are within the BIM, BIM realm, realm as well. So um, I have a Master's of Architecture degree and some others as well. Most of my experience came uh, while working at Autodesk as a technical account manager across uh, architecture, MEP, structure, civil uh, construction. Um, I really got all facets there um, uh, as well. So um, I'm glad that I could spend this time with you today. Um, so for our agenda, I just want to talk briefly about the realities of the AC industry, um, the evolution to BIM, the benefits of BIM, and then we'll get into BIM solutions both on desktop and in cloud services as well. So the current realities for AEC, there's economic pressures that we're all uh, facing and, and you continue to face that. It seems like in our realm it's been feast and or famine over and over again. Sometimes it's decade to decade, sometimes on shorter time spans. Uh, where you have a fluctuation of just too darn much business to too little business and back again. So um, that becomes, it's a reality, it's also a challenge. Um, there are in evolving constructural, uh, contractual structures and business relationships that are evolving as well. And one that comes to mind is integrated project delivery. Um, it's the need for large team workflows and that is changing the way that our project teams collaborate and extending probably owner involvement uh, more than ever before but you get the have an opportunity for the contractor the fabricator to be involved earlier in the process and be able to uh, make uh, constructability and fabrication decisions with you earlier in the process uh, innovative technology is a challenge, but it's also a place where we can build a competitive advantage. And one of those competitive advantages might be through sustainable design. And I'm thinking about the regulatory changes that um, are constantly specifying targets of energy, water, and carbon emissions that um, we have a chance to have that be one of our competitive advantages. So the evolution of BIM via from CAD, if you stop to think about this for a minute, um, focuses on the production of the drawings, not on the models. So when you make a floor plan and you make changes to the floor plan, you have to track down every other place that uh, has that change. So if you insert a door, it's not in the schedule because that, like my second bullet, it's in multiple formats. It's maybe an Excel spreadsheet, for example. It's not part of the same model. Um, consequently, you have a risk of data loss during that co coordination, coordination between disciplines, coordination between drawing files, and, uh, cons and then consequently, uh, late in the design, it gets worse and worse, the impact of this because managing those changes becomes a challenge as well. You make a change uh, early in the process, you don't have as many documents. 
you make a change later in the process, there are many documents and details that are um, problematic around that as well. BIM is a new design approach. The players around um, that model that you're seeing there in the middle are the same. They're the same players that have always been uh, since hand drafting and, heck, I don't know, before cave dwellers. <laughs> um, you know, you got your architects, you got your engineers, you have people that are doing construction and fabrication, prefabrication. Um, I will say that the owners are more involved than they've ever been before because they're um, realizing that they can take advantage of building information modeling and use it within facility management and maintenance management for building operations going forward. Uh, but also, they can get their doors open faster if, um, if the players are all working together on a coordinated model or coordinated models to get that done. And there becomes the different difference. Um, it helps for faster project approvals. Um, when you think about the outcomes, they're more predictable. The analysis that we can do. Um, Across that, the coordinated, consistent information can be used to design, visualize, simulate, analyze, document, and deliver. Um, so consequently, a BIM-based process will help us build be better buildings, I guess is really the one of the bottom lines of it. Um, we can also produce uh, compelling visualizations. So it, this might be about marketing material, but it might be about communication from player to player. Here's how I want something constructed. Uh, here's uh, what would look like for several different material choices here. Here's the cost impact between them. And it might be about marketing material for that matter too. When you're working on a Revit project, for example, a BIM project, uh, as a byproduct to those construction documents that we so much need, uh, there's additionally uh, the three-dimensional model that can help us to visualize it. Now I'm back to the owners again. Uh, you know, when I worked with owners, um, uh, when I was just doing two-dimensional CAD and, and frankly, a little bit of hand drafting in the day, um, you know, I'd lay the floor plan out together with an elevation, and they'd be sitting across from the table and I'd say, you know, here's how the mall entrance is coming along. And they look at me kind of blankly and they'd shake their head yes. <laughs> and um, they didn't get it. You know, um, a, a number of us probably online here are have extensive training and years of visualizing virtually in our own minds what a building looks like. Um, not everybody's trained that way, and even those that are trained can get um, tricked by it thinking oh I thought maybe the lobby would be a little bit bigger and and it's not until we start putting hard hats on and walking around inside the construction that we realize that it's um, not turning out the way we wanted we could have visualized it within the VDC within the virtual file design file and explored it and made rational decisions um, and to make that building better. So what I've done for this one, I, I wanted to be able to um, bounce around really quickly between um, uh, applications here and cloud services. So I thought in terms of leveraging the um, BIM that I would uh, do some recordings of my screen so I can bounce around from product to product and just do uh, two and a half minutes, something like that, snippets of a bunch of different kind of cloud services and desktop applications. So I'm going to start with modeling design and some of the um, pretty, maybe some pretty basic for some of you. Um, this one is uh, Revit in action. And um, so let's just start with that one. Um, when you're uh, working with a Revit model, um, Unlike CAD, uh, as I'm working in plan or whether I'm working in an orthographic view, 
um, the model changes that I do in one view are changed throughout the model. So consequently, I get an opportunity to think about design development and not about the tools that I am picking on. You know, fill it, fill it, stretch, stretch, things like that. Um, those sort of commands, oh, well, actually, there is a fill it command in Revit, <laughs> but it's two different walls getting connected together. It's not a series of lines getting trimmed and connected together. And when I change it in one location, it changes it in all of the views. If I looked at the schedule right now on that material, I have more sheetrock in the schedule. I have more, looks like some kind of a stone material in the schedule. If I drop in a door, the door updates in the schedule and in the plan and in the elevations in every view. Many of the tasks in the AEC process are automated consequently when you're working with uh, BIM and Revit in this case. So um, they all are using the same underlying information and the update happens automatically across all drawings, views, and schedules. Um, consequently, by me interacting in this sort of way with it, I'm more productive. Um, consequently, when I'm working with it, I'm more profitable because of the automated tasks. And also, I can create a higher quality building. And this might be aesthetics, or it might be about um, the analysis that goes with it. Um, I thought maybe I'd do next for you a um, solar study, for example, just one of the many ways that you can work with the model because you're working with a model. looks like it's just kind of floating in space out here, but the model, you can choose a location. It knows, you know, what kind of weather stations are near it. Um, it knows what sun angles would be at any given time of day and I can support effective passive solar design consequently. Um, it might not be about um, casting shadows. It might be about balancing heat gain with natural daylighting. Um, the point, valuable insights are gained um, by working with the model. I thought I'd do another um, example that's around uh, Revit MEP in the same fashion. I'm working on the three-dimensional model here of this hospital. Um, for this realm as well, um, it automates many of the tasks. Um, I pick on an air terminal and I say I want to connect into this duct that's near it. It looks at the routing preferences that are associated with that and chooses the components and the size of duct that's appropriate to uh, connecting into the um, larger service that's running through the area. Um, there's the new change that I had just made. If I look at it in plan, if that's where I choose to work, I can do the same functions there and get the same result um, in any one of those views. Once again, a higher quality because the design is being interacted on at a high level allowing me to think um, beyond individual tools. But also, you think about the, what you're seeing here on the screen. Instead of a small um, number of stakeholders, let me just pause this just for a second. Uh, instead of a small number of stakeholders being able to work on this, um, this sort of thing is understandable by a larger group and can be shared with a larger group. That way, all stakeholders have a clear vision of how things are going to fit. So let me flip back over to this once and talk about leveraging that model. <clears throat> I was looking at a design and, and modeling uh, stance from the architectural standpoint. The same thing is true um, on the MEP side and the structural side. Um, Walls have intelligence. The spaces, the beams, they have an intelligence. The walls have thermal mass. Um, they have resistance and R value. They're based on the layers of materials. They know the sheathing, the brick, the sheetrock, and the like. Uh, spaces are more than just thin air. 
they hold reflectance on the surfaces for light calculations, the area per person it knows, the sensible heat gain per person. On the structural side of the house, a beam knows its structural usage, the structural material, the torsional movement of inertia, its warping constant. So consequently, project teams can use this kind of information with a variety of analytical tasks. It might be about environmental analysis. It might be about energy and building performance analysis or structural analysis. So now let me go back to what I had recorded for you before. What I, I wanted to show you in product heating and cooling and uh, loads here. Um, and then I'll hit some cloud services for the same sort of thing so you can see how the Autodesk solutions extend it so that we can go beyond that if we so desire. Um, that air terminal and ductwork that I just put in, there's a supply diffuser out there. It knows what kind of a flow, in this case 500 CFM, that it's supposed to be delivering through that 6-inch uh, opening. Whatever is gathering next step up, like the VAV there, knows the um, addition of all of the supply diffusers that are underneath it. Um, if I run a heating and cool cooling analysis in product on that, I can pull back a report that looks like this, all in product without having a login, without us using um, a a subscription service to get this done. This part of it is Revit out of the box uh, with um, uh, reports like you're seeing there. Um, I did two others though for you. Um, I wanted to show you the uh, Green Building Studio. So let me show you that one now. So what I did there was it's very similar to what I did just a moment ago with doing the heating and cooling in, in product. Um, I come in and explore the spaces, those green cubes you're seeing out there, those are individual spaces. Um, and those spaces know that they're against an exterior wall, for example. They know that they're adjoining other spaces where the heating and cooling loads would be different. In this case, I would export to GBXML or Green Building XML file. And now we're seeing Green Building Studio. Um, where I've uploaded the file um, and and it is doing the analysis um, up there in the cloud. So this is an example that's a perfect candidate for um, a cloud service. Um, analysis is compute intensive. So you can see here on energy cost and the like um, the report that it's giving me and I just hovered over a few of these bars so that you could see some of the values that come back for the drill down. See how if I get in a little bit closer, I find out about um, the pumps, for example, the domestic hot water, the space heat, and the like. Um, and can run and display charts based on cost or energy um, for the building as it exists when I uploaded it out of the GBXML file. Now I'm, I'm going to pause this for just a second though here. Um, cloud services are interesting. Um, they're doing a couple of things for us here. You have a server farm on some far end that you do not have to support. So you don't need IT involved with it. You don't need to do an install. You don't have to do upgrades. It all happens automatically for you by little elves in some remote location. Um, secondly, what, what is just really cool about it is um, Green Building Studio, I was working with it one day and I uploaded my model and they had some buttons in there that I could do things like what if scenario what if I decrease the southern exposure windows by 10% and now rerun that calculation for me? Um, that it did um, a number of years ago when the service was first introduced. But one day I went up to this site and what they were doing on the other end was when I uploaded my model, 
they made deviations to my model. There was the original one, but they made deviations 32 times over, making small tweaks to, to my model, just running what-if scenarios for me proactively. <laughs> I think that's just really cool. Um, for them to run those, I might have never even dreamed about doing. Then I look at the bar charts there, and I say, oh, my goodness, this one's really good. What was it that you did? <laughs> and then maybe I consider doing the same thing to my Revit model and going forward with the model in that fashion. Um, there's another one uh, that is a cloud service as well. Um, it's called Energy Analysis for Revit. And yes, it is a terrible name. Okay, now let me pause it for just a second while I get on the soapbox. Yes, it's a terrible name. <laughs> but it is exactly what it is. Energy analysis for Revit. It's kind of like the other service they put out there, collaboration for Revit. It, it just doesn't sound like a product or a service. But um, so anyway, look to the words energy analysis for Revit for this cloud service. The difference what you're seeing here is that it works on conceptual models. So you're seeing massing here that we're working with, the conceptual mass. And I'm, I'm running it based on the conceptual mass. I run the analysis, and then I take a look at the report that's generated from that the results. And there's the couple of um, runs that I had done. Carbon emissions, energy use, fuel, electricity, monthly heating loads and the like, and cooling loads. Um, some different um, kind of results uh, than we were seeing in Green Building Studio in terms of wind roses and things like that that I don't think were a part of Green Building Studio. So it's not necessarily like you use one or the other, but maybe you're using both of them to... Uh, I'm going to pause this for just a second. Maybe, maybe you're using both of them to run your analysis. Um, the reason I paused it was... A, a, in, in the group, I, I used to work at Autodesk, and, and I've worked with the um, uh, programmers and the like that work on this uh, product mix and the services mix. And their mantra is early and often. And what, what we're talking about here is do analysis like this early in the project life cycle as design development is very initial and it's a gleam in your eye it's conceptual design right at that phase of it and often make a change then run it again right and um, if you can do this early you have unlimited um, possibilities for making change and it doesn't cost anything okay other than your time <laughs> it doesn't cost anything think about later on when a project is going on and you need to make a change because maybe you got a clash or something like that, um, it involves jackhammers, right? It's very expensive. Early, you can change anything you can imagine and dream of. Later, you still can, but it's just really costly in terms of time and money, okay? So early and often. So for example, I went on to record this. I took the conceptual mass and I stretch it out. You see how the north side of the building now is, is much larger. So the, the volume of the building, the floor space and walls and everything have expanded out in this model. It's going to get different results. And I run it again. Except this time I say, let's use the existing project and group them together. This is more just a grouping thing. So you can have, you know, maybe four different buildings that you're working on, for example. But if you take a look at the energy simulation that occurs from that, I can pick on both of them and hit the compare button. And then it brings up the two side by side, which I think this is cool. Um, I can swing down through the results and compare them and decide by making this change, here's the impact. Um, here's what I might want to um, do or not do based on those results. So a, a BIM prod process like this that we're seeing, um, it 
allows us to use an integrated analysis to help make an informed design decision and informed construction decisions. And the project outcomes are controlled. At least we improve our control anyway because of the valuable insights that we get across the building life cycle. So the, the kind of services and products that I've shown you here so far, um, they are right in line with at least one of the aims of Autodesk, which is to allow you to have additional capabilities at your disposal without having to upset the apple cart with big changes in workflow. Now, granted, moving from CAD to BIM is a pretty big jump, right? But from there, once you've made it into the world of BIM, you can add in uh, and mix and match together services and other applications in order to uh, make life better for you, in order to make that building better for humanity, <laughs> all right? So, don't lose sight of the workflow though. Just because I'm trying to show you some point solutions that can be mixed and matched depending on whether or not you um, would like to take advantage of a service like that. Um, some of what Autodesk is um, also concentrating on is to make sure that we don't lose sight of the overall workflow. And I, I wanted, you maybe have seen the acronym thrown around, well not really acronym, well BIM's an acronym, but the words thrown around a BIM 360, um, it's uh, Autodesk, at least at the making of uh, this webcast, anyway, I suppose we'll get it posted, this is January of 2016, um, Autodesk's probably going to change the name 12 times over on these things because um, it is a moving target. Um, both what your needs are and what technologies are. Right now they're calling it BIM Autodesk BIM 360, and um, it's a collection of services, uh, which are all, every one of them is cloud-based, or at least hooks into something desktop that ends up in the cloud. Uh, there's one other that's on, that's not part of this diagram, it's um, 360 Docs as well. Um, let me kind of walk you through that a little bit so that you can kind of get a sense for across the building life cycle. Um, where these would play. So I'm, I might get into this one a little bit deeper, or it, at all, um, in uh, next week's uh, part two presentation, uh, 360 Glue. Uh, some of what you're seeing there is, if you have a familiarity with Navisworks, it's kind of like Navisworks in the cloud, very much so. Um, you can do clash detection up there. You can do uh, markup, redlining. You can aggregate your model and, ex and explore it. Uh, maybe you don't even want to do the clashes there. Maybe you just want to be able to explore the model and see how the rest of the players are coming along. I think one of the things that is particularly interesting to me about it is that uh, with Navisworks, if you're using that in your team, um, the workflow commonly is that one entity, you know, maybe it's the um, mechanical engineer takes the role of Navisworks uh, BIM model manager and uh, all the rest of the players, the architects, electrical engineer, structural engineer, etc., will keep posting updated files once a week or something like that for that model manager to aggregate the model, do clash detection, and then send reports to the rest of the team. Or um, I've also uh, worked with um, engineers and architects that will use GoToMeeting to explore the model together. Uh, Glue really um, solves that um, part of the business pain in, in that each one of the entities, architects, engineers, owner, if, there's, if the owner is contributing as well, perhaps with the facility management side, um, contributing to the model directly without having to have one person in the middle that plays BIM jockey. Okay, so um, that's nice because the it puts the weight on on multiple shoulders instead of on one one entity shoulders that maybe is not getting any kind of um, getting paid for it, right? Um, 
Also, um, one thing that's kind of interesting about it is the uh, BIM 360 layout. They have two different services that are uh, tied together here um, on the back end. And uh, we had, as a part of the TopCon Roadshow that we had done a few months ago, um, we did that as a part of a live presentation where we, uh, were, I worked in Revit and laid in some points with Autodesk Point Layout, then pumped it up into Glue. It automatically transferred over to Layout, and my colleague that was running the TopCon LN100 uh, robotic uh, was able to see it with um, on his iPad, like you're seeing there on the left image, and uh, do um, field. Um, field verification on whether we were using pipe hangers, for example, whether the pipe hangers were at the right location and right elevation, uh, right distance off the floor. Pretty cool. Um, oh, let me just briefly touch on a couple of these others. Um, there's one that's 360 plan, looks kind of like this. This is for uh, work plans. Uh, there's another one called field, 360 field. So uh, this one's, uh, I, I guess I think, I guess you could use it in a variety of, of, um, of veins. Um, I, I think about it for punch lists, for example, during the construction process, um, especially towards the end. Uh, you know, somebody's walking by with a, um, with a metal stud and they swing to the left and it puts a hole in the sheetrock that's already been put in place and then you come back through and you, you know that that needs to be repaired before you can close out the building and so um, it, it uh, enables that sort of thing. Somebody in the field perhaps with a handheld like an iPad or something like that um, is looking at the plans. They, they get access to the model, they get access to the updated information from the mothership, you know, whoever their colleagues are back in the comfort of the um, work trailer or back in the office. And um, everybody is communicating together in that vein as well. And then the last one, I'm taking a closer look at this one myself, so I'll I'll um, uh, be glad to work with you on this. It's on the um, building operations side. Um, I guess by now you figured out that actually Revit itself is a facility management program or can be used in that fashion for both facility management and maintenance management and building operations. Uh, the, the construction documents that we needed to build the building house data so that thing that's in the model knows that it's a boiler and it knows if you put it in there uh, when the warranty expires on it when a filter needs to be changed on a um, you know a furnace a air handling unit or whatever um, with building operations I'm kind of intrigued by this one because I'm hoping that it um, enables the field with um, handhelds like, um, I guess it's on three different things, on the iPhone, iPad, and iPod, um, iPod something or other. <laughs> I don't iPod have one. Touch. iPod Touch, I suppose, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. But anyway, I'll have to take a closer look at that one. I, I just, I wanted to bring this up because I wanted you to think about lean construction planning software and what Autodesk is doing around that. I'm gonna shift gears here. Um, with um, a, another application, uh, Recap. And if you bought Building Design Suite, I bet you've seen it there. And um, if you haven't used it, I wanted to introduce you to it a little bit. Um, point clouds, 3D laser scans are becoming more pre prevalent and um, are um, a huge benefit. I mean, we're Okay, so we're talking about renovations probably more than anything, at least the way my brain is wired. If my colleague were in here, the the guys that do dirt, you know, on the civil side, they'd actually be, well, I guess um, any, um, <clears throat> any um, grass field or whatever that's going to house a building is basically renovating the dirt. <laughs> but I, I think about um, you know, your three-phase project that is an existing science building or something like that, and you're trying to um, make adaptive reuse and you're doing renovation. You need to capture the reality of the way that it exists at, at any given time. 
So um, with the, the scanner, like you're seeing there, it's, it's um, kind of a three-step process where you capture and then um, you compute, you know, so um, Autodesk calls it computing. Uh, you're seeing a screen capture of recap there. Um, we're inside the point cloud virtually. And we can do, um, you know, perhaps you need to do cleanup at this point. Maybe you need to register together uh, multiple point clouds. Maybe you need to cut off the bounding box or um, remove certain pixels that, um, that were captured. Um, and then uh, create. So I did a screen capture here with that same one used inside of Revit and drew a wall down the middle of it. So um, it, I, I think you might find it a little bit confusing if you're trying to sort this out. And I thought it maybe, I, there's no way I'm going to sort it out for you on a little webcast like this. This could be a whole separate one, no doubt about it. But um, I thought I'd start it this way. Um, what we're looking at right now is recap. So this is the one that comes in Building Design Suite, for example. Um, and they have it listed as, as um, in the comparison chart as free. I, I've actually never tried to download it just by itself because it's always given to me with Building Design Suite. But um, I, I might just back up just a little bit as I'm working around here. Let me wait. Here, here's a good spot. Look, look off to the left if you don't even know what I'm talking about with a point cloud or a 3D laser scan. Um, I'm finding that as um, students are coming in and taking at least my essentials class anyway, uh, that a third of them don't even know what the um, term means. And um, so when you get involved in the middle of that uh, here now, you'll know it's a whole series of little dots, right, that have been captured by that device that you saw a couple of screens ago kind of a big glorified camera, if you will. It kind of looks like a monster camera or a uh, total station or something like a surveying equipment kind of thing. Do you see the dot that's out there or that, that black area out in the middle of the, of the um, street? That's where they set up at. And then it sends out, uh, you know, basically it's recording how far away everything is. And the longer you let it sit there, the more dots it will capture. They'll be denser, probably closer to the, the capturing point. And, um, and they can map color to those as well. So here's what it looks like in recap, and maybe this is the place where I might clean it up. Now, before I move on, I just jumped over into Revit and the use of recap there. There's three different um, products slash services that I'd like to introduce you to. Um, recap, the one that you see in Building Design Suite, for example. Recap 360, that one's a cloud service. And then Recap 360 Ultimate, okay. Um, so there's three different terms, at least here in January, what they're calling them right now. They've, it's gone through a couple of name changes. There's a fourth thing that happened with the acquisition of Recap um, by Autodesk. I think it went into the 2014 product, so it must have been about the year 2013 that they acquired this. Um, point clouds got really, really interesting at that time. Prior to that, I couldn't handle in Revit, AutoCAD, etc. I couldn't handle as big a point cloud. Um, I think it went up by a factor of 10 when they took the recap engine and embedded it into at least four different products from Autodesk. They put it in Revit, which is the one I personally care about the most. Uh, they put it in Inventor, uh, 3ds Max, and in AutoCAD. And um, here's a here's a point cloud in Plan View, in Revit. Um, now I'm going to go over to the Camera View, and you can see well, you can see right where that um, where they had set it up at. Um, so now I'm in Revit, the place where I'm modeling, the place where I need to do um, construction documents. Um, here's what it looks like in, in Revit, and it, I'll just pause there for just a second. Um, I, I chose this data set to uh, highlight because say that you had to do a renovation on this building. 
how do you measure that if you're the poor schmuck that gets sent out to the field to measure this thing? Um, it's, it's really hard, right? How do you capture that, right? Um, and um, this one's an obvious example of um, the value that can be brought to the uh, construction document, um, renovation, um, the reality capture that we're able to do there. Uh, another project that I'm working on right now, um, it's, it's not so maybe cool as this one. Uh, really what we need to do is it's a renovation and the concrete inside the building is, uh, has obvious deviations in it for the floor. And um, we're doing a, um, a 3D laser scan of it because what we're hoping is to see those deviations in the Revit design development process and then work it through from there. So um, this one, you know, one other aspect I thought I'd just show you yet too is um, one aspect of, of Recap 360. Um, you can see in the upper right-hand corner the photo bubbles as they've been placed within the and seen together um, within the site. Um, I'll pause this right here because this would be a good place for you to start. Um, uh, just go to Autodesk.com and then uh, you can go to their compare. They have a real nice compare up there that compares Recap, Recap 360 and Recap 360 Ultimate. Um, these two columns over here are recap. It says free. Um, it's the one that comes with that you saw first, and it comes with building design suite. Um, the ones over here, recap 360 and recap 360 ultimate. Those are cloud services by subscription. So um, this one, this they both deal with laser scans, but you saw at least the one example that I gave you. Uh, is around additionally around photos with Recap 360. So, um, and I'll just let it play through this um, just to scroll down a little bit. You can see that they have the comparison chart that's um, really pretty, pretty nice about that. <clears throat> when, we, when we do our uh, session on um, this um, coming Tuesday, um, I'll, I'll be getting in the Navis works and the like, but um, um, I'm going to hold off on the visualization uh, piece. Uh, we got just a little bit of a late start here today, and um, I, I'd like to leave a little bit of time for questions and answers as well. well at least questions. I guess we'll see if I have answers or not. Um, and um, but uh, uh, one of the things that I'll be getting into um, on Tuesday is about uh, visualization and um, where they land in process visualization, uh, visual communication, and uh, photorealism and cinematic animation, and then how those work together as well. Um, here at the PPI group, we're um, offering a class, um, a new class that's um, 3DS Max for Revit users. And um, I'm kind of excited about that one because uh, you'll still be building your model in Revit, but um, we're going to help you with the um, cinematic animation and photorealism. So um, just kind of in conclusion here um, for what we've been doing today, um, leveraging the BIM model can be throughout the project lifecycle. So if you think about conceptualizing clear through to managing, uh, the building, um, the whole project team can be involved in this. It, it does not have to be um, just within a small group that are working on the model. It can be through the project life cycle of documentation, visualization, quantification. Uh, on um, next Tuesday, I'll, with Navisworks, I'll do um, 4D sequencing. We call it the timeliner in in Navisworks, um, and we'll do clash detection and coordination in Navisworks as well. And then consequently out of that can come uh, estimating, scheduling, and um, O&M, right, for operate and maintain. So um, as I, oh, maybe I'll leave this up on the screen here as I talk with my colleagues about uh, questions and answers. It's going to be at uh, 10 o'clock uh, Pacific time. And um, if you haven't signed up for it yet, just come up to the ppigroup.com 
and you'll see one of the buttons is there, you're invited. And this way, um, and you can check back on that later too because we're constantly doing um, different kinds of webcasts and the like. You might find some others that you'd like to sign up for as well. Go ahead and end the, the webinar. Uh, keep an eye out on our You're Invited tab up there at our website um, as we continue to populate it with more opportunities, um, webinars, and live events around the area. We're pretty excited to, to get started um, off on the right foot here in 2016. So thank you for all attending. Thank you very much, Kurt. Appreciate sure. your time. And we will see you next week. Bye-bye.